Again, I'm rocking the bold eye look and pajama combo down here in the sewing room. I really do need to make some like really glam loungewear to wear around the house because I work from home so often that it would be nice to have, I don't want to get like completely dolled up to be at home all day, she says with this much eye makeup on, but it would be nice to have like 1940s house dresses and things like that. So we'll have to work on loungewear sometime, but not today, not today. Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian. Today we're starting my fall and winter sewing series here on the channel. I don't know why I'm kind of breaking this into seasons. I guess it's like my fashion background. I did go to school for apparel production and design. So now I think I'd split my sewing in the same way in my brain. I have like spring summer sewing and fall winter sewing. But starting with the fall projects today, I'm going to be making a 1920s one hour dress in a nice burnout velvet, which is always very fall and fun. And I am particularly excited to share this pattern drafting process with all of you guys, because normally here on the channel, when I'm doing my pattern drafting, I'm using my basic block or sloper pattern, basically to be able to draft patterns or to change darts and things like that to, because the uh, other things I draft usually 1940s and 50s styles are much more form fitting. And so they require things like darts and style lines, and things like that. But the 1920s, you're just wearing a, a big bag of fabric, basically. That's kind of the look. It's, I mean, great. It, it, I think this is the, the glamorous alternative to wearing the modern t-shirt and sweatpants because it's just a, a big loose sack of fabric, let's be honest, but we pretend or we think it is quite glamorous. Um, so the 1920s uh, is such a different silhouette to any other vintage time period and anything that had come before um, and definitely had influence on fashion that came afterwards, of course. But that's the nice thing about making 1920s clothes is it is kind of just big geometric shapes and looser things. So I'll be showing you how to draft this 1920s one hour dress pattern. I'll show you here some images of actual 1920s like pamphlets and patterns and fashion plates and things like that of very similar styles to this. Uh, I'll zoom in here on this pattern here. We can see we're basically going to be drawing this pattern here today. Very similar um, to these illustrations from the 20s, which is why I feel like this is one of the more uh, accurate and yet simple projects that anyone can start with when it comes to vintage sewing. But not everyone is interested in 1920s fashion. A lot of people are interested in more mid-century fashion. I happen to like it all and jump around era to era. So this is a project that I've done many, many times before over on my blog. I've worn many a one hour dress and done some variations on them. So I will link to some blog posts in the description below of this video because I have done several blog posts about this style of dress before showing me wearing the style of dress. So I will put my 1920s like posts in the description of this video as well. But for now, let's just go ahead and jump over to the blue pattern drafting table of doom and get started making this 1920s one hour dress pattern. All right, I have this little sheet here with lots of different stuff to talk about, but we're just gonna start with talking about the basic shape of this pattern. So the very basic shape of this is like this sort of large wide eye sort of shape here um, is the pattern we're gonna be creating today. This is a dress that only has two pieces. It has a front and a back and they are identical. So it's again, a very easy project, which is why they called it the one hour dress because it's hypothetically so easy you can do it in an hour, but I highly doubt that. So to make this pattern, we are going to need a few measurements, of course. Uh, that's all we're going to need. We don't need a sloper or a bodice block for this pattern today because, you know, that's that's for fitting things quite close to the body. And in the 20s, we didn't worry about things being close to the body. So my measurements today are 42 bust, 30 waist and 44 hip. Of course, like measurements vary day by day, honestly, depending on, you know, how many burritos you had the day before. But um, today, this is my measurements and what I will be using to draft my pattern today. So up here, the other measurements you will need, those are like the measurements of your body. So use a measuring tape, measure yourself or have a friend. Um, but the other measurements you will want are from the shoulder line to the hem of your dress. So how long you want the full dress to be from your shoulder to, let's say, like a couple inches past your knee, perhaps. Um, and then how long you want your, or how far you want your drop waist to be. So from your shoulder to like, say the top of your hip, um, like underneath your waist. So like my natural waist would probably be like here on this pattern, but a few inches down from your waist where like the fullness of your hips begins is where you're gonna wanna put this drop waist on this 1920s dress. So you're gonna want your full length of shoulder to hem and then also from shoulder to the drop waist area. Um, again, you are kind of just arbitrarily deciding this. Uh, better to get it a little bit high than a little bit low for fit reasons. Um, because this is so easy to make, it wouldn't be bad to make a mock-up and then you can fiddle with that if you decided it was too high or too low. Um, because this is a pretty easy pattern to make, you could easily make a muslin if you should so desire. And now for your measurements, the most important one of these is going to be actually the bust measurement because the bust measurement is what we're going to use to decide how wide the 
uh, like main width the dresses, I suppose. So if this, you're imagining, you know, one is the front, we do have another one for the back. So we need half of your bust measurement is what the main little rectangle, if you imagine a rectangle in here, of your pattern is going to be half, the width of half your bust measurement plus one and a half inches. Uh, I'm just choosing one and a half inches of ease quite kind of arbitrarily. I didn't used to add very much ease at all. Um, and you can, I mean, I didn't used to, so you can get away with not adding much ease, but it's actually more accurate for this to be like a loose sack of a dress um, for the 1920s because the 1920s are just not a very fitted time. So I'm actually gonna add one and a half inches to the front and the back pattern, which will mean three um, inches of ease overall all around here. So basically you're drawing, I mean, you could almost, hmm. I'm gonna draw this here. If you wanted this to be more of a sleeveless dress, you wouldn't need these extensions. And um, so if you imagine, you could almost draw your pattern, maybe this is how we'll do it today. And all this being half of your bust measurement plus whatever ease you want. So my bust measurement today is 42. So the main body of my dress, the little rectangle that's hiding in this eye, needs to be uh, 42 bust, so divided by two, is 21 plus an inch and a half, 22 and a half. So this area here on my pattern is gonna be 22 and a half inches wide. I'm gonna add probably, let's say four inches uh, for the sleeves and then four inches for the hip extension as well. Um, that'll encompass the extra bit of space I need for my hips, but also just give me a little bit of a pleat there, a little bit more flow in the skirt, a little bit more walkability, things like that. And then this sleeve is basically a kimono sleeve, like an all-in-one sleeve like we did here on the channel before, but sort of the 20s version of that, or a more accurate, and actually, to a actual Japanese kimono. This is getting closer. Uh, so no, still not quite there, but we're getting closer there to an actual kimono sleeve. All-in-one T-shaped little sleeve here. So your shoulders just here, and this just kind of hangs down um, and creates a little sleeve shape from the nature of it hanging from your shoulder. As usual, I feel like I'm not doing a very good job explaining, um, but I'm trying here, guys, I'm trying. Hopefully throughout the length of this video, things will make sense. Um, so basically to draw this pattern, we're just gonna draw this rectangle that is as long as you want your dress to be from shoulder to hem and as wide as half your bust measurement plus ease. And then we will draw on little extensions up here at the top for the sleeves. I'm just gonna make these 10 inches down from the shoulder line. That's basically how I like to do these. Uh, I found that's a measurement that works for me. You could do the sleeve dropped lower, that would be fine. Um, it's just a bit of more of a drapey look. You could have it be tighter if you wanted to, but then you really are gonna have to mock that up and figure out what might be too tight. Um, I just think 10 inches is a good base starting point to go from, so that's what I'm gonna be doing, 10 inches down from the shoulder line is where I will add this sleeve extension onto my rectangle heading inside this pattern. And then I will also add four inches down here that I will either turn into a little box pleat at the hip or do gathering. I am actually gonna make two dresses for this video and in one I will do the box pleat and in the other I will do the gathering. I've shown the different ways to control the hip fullness on these dresses before over on my blog, so I will be linking that blog post in the description of this video as well. So let's just go ahead and get started with this pattern. Hopefully as I go through making my pattern and showing you how I sew this dress together, you'll get a good idea if I've missed anything here. Really, it is quite simple. You just need that bust measurement and to draw a big eye. It's gonna be, it's gonna be fine, I think. Um, some things to talk about with this pattern though, however, this is the basic one where it's just like a big, you know, rectangles. You can, if you wanted to have this be a big triangle, it will create a handkerchief hem. I'll put an image of one that I've made like this before. Um, this one doesn't have sleeves, but it has that handkerchief hem on it. The way you do those is just a big triangle here. Um, and so that's one way to do this. You can, of course, add a seam here. Instead of having this be one of these for the front, one of these for the back, you can cut the skirt portion off and then have a different shaped one, or you can cut this all in one if you have a really wide fabric. Um, but usually if I'm doing a different shape than the regular rectangle, I will cut, I will make a seam here and then you will have to add seam allowance along this part because anytime you cut into a pattern, you need to add seam allowance. So that's kind of one way to change up the skirt on this is to do it as a handkerchief hem by doing that as a triangle. Um, another way too is just to have this be wider and then you can kind of hem these two sections here um, and let's say like have them open and have them hang and they kind of hang in a waterfall-y way along the side. Again, I will try and find images of the different skirt variations as we go through these. Um, you can again separate along the waist here, add a circle skirt on there. It's not very, I mean, I, there are some 1920s dresses that have a more circular shaped skirt, but it's more of a 50s thing, but you can do whatever skirt shape you want on here. Um, you can, of course, just 
do this as a circle as well, a triangle, a circle. Whatever shape of skirt you want to do on these, you can. This is all just very basic geometry for when it comes to 1920 styles. The same is true of these sleeves too. Of course, you could do this as a curve here if you wanted to. You could do it as like a triangle and have it hang in more of a handkerchief-ish way. And then of course you can change the neckline if you wanted to do this with a facing and like put a V in here, scoop this out a little bit just so it's a little bit more comfortable. I never even really bother because I suffer from fashion all the time. It's fine. Um, but you can do uh, whatever kind of neckline variations you want over here too. Just draw them on and use a facing or line this garment, whatever, whichever you would wish. Um, so you can change it up, but I'm just gonna be doing the very basic 1920s dress, like standard 1920s dress that I've made a lot, a lot of times. Um, the one hour here for us today in my burnout velvet, which is sitting uh, just there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and make this pattern and I'll talk you through mine. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw it out. Over here to a mannequin to show you, um, I'll just sort of talk about a little bit, the measurement from the top of your shoulder to where you want the drop waist on your dress. Now, of course, this girl, she's a very, very flat bum. But if you imagine like where the fullness of the bum starts, that's where you're gonna wanna, like on this girl, from shoulder to drop waist, like to the fullness of her lack of bum here would be like 18 inches is probably where I would put it, but it's a little higher. So if you imagine like the bum starts here, you wanna kind of do the drop waist right before that fullness starts, like the curve comes in here. So from the shoulder down to where the drop waist begins, for this girl's pattern, I would put it at 18. On my body personally, it's actually like 22. Um, so like the distance from my shoulder to where like the main fullness of my hip is, is probably like 24. So I wanna go above that, 22. You kinda of see what I'm saying? So like you don't want, like the hip measurement is taken at the widest part of your body. So like across the like widest part of your bum and then all the way around at like an evil level, even level, evil level, an even level. So like that on me is 44 inches, but you wanna start your drop waist above that. That way that ease is already there in the pattern when it comes to start going over your body. So like on this girl, it would be up here at like 17 or 18 is where that drop waist should be on her pattern. On mine, it's gonna be at 22. So measure down from your shoulder or have a friend help you measure down from your shoulder to like above where your hip fullness, your the width of your hips and your bum begins. And that's gonna be where your drop waist is. It's below your natural waist. You're gonna choose a lot. You can even, like you can go a little bit higher if you want to. It doesn't really matter that it's as low as possible. Like just as long as it's between your natural waist and where the fullness the fullest part of your hip and bum are. Um, so you wanna be in that zone somewhere. Again, also for like imagining from shoulder to the hem line of something, like this girl doesn't have legs, but if let's say this is her knee, you know, I would wanna figure out, okay, maybe I'll make this dress 41 inches on her. So from shoulder to hem would be 41, and then from shoulder to the hip fullness would be again, like 17 or 18. Again, she just doesn't have a bum, so that makes it hard to explain. Um, so that's, you know, how I would do it on this imaginary foam person. But for me, my shoulder to drop waist is gonna be 22 inches. My shoulder to hem is gonna be, let's say 45 today. So again, I've written my choices or measurements down here. Um, 45 from the top of my shoulder. Again, if we imagine our pattern looks like this. Um, so the full length of this is gonna be 45. This distance here from the shoulder to the drop waist is gonna be 22. So that's where I'm using those measurements. That's where I got those measurements. That's what I'm gonna be doing. And then of course the distance across the center here is my bust measurement, 42 divided by two, 21, plus the one and a half inches of ease. So it's 22 and a half inches across this pattern. And then of course, front and back, it totals up to be the 42 plus three, you know, the 45. So it's gonna be 45 long and 45 wide, but you know, it's a very geometric pattern. So that's just how it works out for me. Again, these things will not come out the same if let's say your waist measurement is larger than your bust. Like I've never made one um, that way just because I've only ever made things for myself. Um, ever since university at least, I've only ever made things for myself. So I've never done it before, but I would assume just go, um, like the reason I'm using the bust measurement for the main rectangle in here of the dress is because that is my large, like one of my larger measurements. Um, down here I'm adding fullness. So um, after this line, after the drop waist, I can add as much as I want, you know, to the sides and that will help with the hips. So it, it, 
if this was, if your hips were, let's say here, my measurements are 42, 30, 44, right? So I only have to add a little bit more extra on from here to get from 42 to 44. But let's say if your measurement was, you know, 60 hip and a 42, you just add more here. So the hip isn't a problem. Um, and if you have, let's say, um, we have this center waist section, we have this top sleeve section, and then we have the skirt section. If your waist measurement is larger than your bust measurement, then just, you know, make this uh, widest part of your pattern your waist measurement. There's like, of these two measurements, bust and waist, for me, you choose the one that's larger. So for me, the larger one is the bust. That's the measurement that I will use for my main triangle. If your larger measurement is your waist that's larger than your bust, just make this triangle with your waist measurement instead. Um, that's why you want to take all three of those measurements because for me, this one's not going to matter because 1920s dresses don't, aren't, um, you know, concentrated on the waist. Um, so I'm going to use my larger measurement of those two. But if your waist is your larger of those two, then use that as the rectangle in the center. Oh God, hopefully that made sense. Um, I've, I never made one that way, but I assume it will still work out because, and then just add on again more for your sleeves like I'm about to do. It should work out just fine. It's just, you want to use the larger of those two measurements because you're just encompassing the whole body in this like sheet of fabric anyway, because the twenties are funny that way. Um, so that's kind of the work around there. As far as I would understand it, that's what I assume would work fine as well. If your waist measurement happens to be bigger than your bust and then like whatever your hip measurement is, no matter how much larger or smaller it is than your other measurements, you'll just be able to add an extension or just keep, if you, um, for example, if your measurements were 40, 30, 30 or something, like, I don't know, if your hips were just as narrow as your waist for some wild reason, because you're a mannequin, um, then you would just make this pattern like so. You can, like, don't have to worry about adding any hip fullness, then just make it straight from there and just add on for the sleeves and you'll have a T-shaped pattern instead. I don't really, it doesn't really matter which letter it comes out to be as long as it comes out looking like a flowy little 20s dress, right? So those are some workarounds for if your measurements are very different from mine. Um, feel free to ask me questions in the comments below and I'll try and answer them to the best of my ability as usual as well. Um, different, if you have a question on like, I don't know if this will work because of my measurements, let me take a crack at it. Uh, let me know in the comments below. But anyway, <laughs> I've started drawing my pattern here. I have a very large piece of alphanumeric paper here. I will link to where I buy this paper in the description below. A lot of people do tend to ask me about it. It is called alphanumeric paper because there are numbers and letters, uh, one inch grid on here. Um, so you can buy it, I think, with like dots instead. And a lot of times you'll hit called dot paper as well. Uh, I bought it on a big I buy it on a big roll from a company called Atlas Levy, Levy I believe is what the paper company is called. Um, it's not too expensive actually, and I love having it for pattern drafting because of course you can have these large sheets of it. It's very useful, especially for a pattern like this where it's only two pieces, but two very large pieces. So I've just drawn a rectangle here, and this is an 18 inch ruler. So this rectangle is 22 and a half inches from that side to this side. So that is my half my bust measurement plus the ease that I want to use for this pattern. So this is the base, you know, the, the triangle or the um, rectangle I keep talking about in the center of this pattern. So now we're going to add on these little extensions up here for the sleeve. Like I said, I just come down 10 inches. So if I imagine I'm going to come down 10 inches from the shoulder line, bloop, wherever that is here, I think, hopefully see this ruler is the right direction. No, this way. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm just going to go ahead and come down 10 on each side. You can uh, fold this in half as well. Like if you wanted to make only half of this pattern, you could. I, I'm just making it in full because I like to use full patterns sometimes to see if I have, a have see if I have enough fabric. So if I'm like laying out fabric in the big floor of the basement area of our house, I'm like laying out fabric to see if my circle skirt pattern will fit on it, to see if my 20s dress pattern will fit on it. Sometimes I like creating my patterns in full, but you can you know, this is 22 and a half, you could do 11 and a quarter and then just do one little extension for the sleeve and one little extension for the hip. I just like making it in full, especially because I'm explaining it here to you and I want you to see the whole thing. So again, I'll come down 10 on this side and then I'm just going to come out four inches for my sleeve extension here. That's just usually what I do for these and I found it worked over the years. Again, uh, maybe start with four and then you can change it to whichever you would like. That kind of creates a little short sleeve on this pattern. So I'm going to go ahead and draw on my 10 by four extensions onto my rectangle. Okay, so that's what that looks like. This again, this main big rectangle here is my uh, half bust measurement plus the ease. And then I've just put on 
the extra little sections to create the little kimono sleeve up here at the top. Um, imagine this line, you know, goes away. It's just a big T shape up here. This just falls into a little bit of a sleeve. My shoulder is like right in here somewhere. So this just falls off my shoulder and will create a little bit of a kimono sleeve when this is done. You can uh, skip this if you wanted to just put some bias tape around this area, leave it as an armhole, that would be fine too. Um, again, I will show an example. I've added a cowl to this one, but this is wished with just without this little extension on it. It's just using this area kind of as a strap, although I did add a cowl neck to that one as well, which maybe we'll do sometime if people are interested in more 1920s one hour modifications, do let me know in the comments below if that's something you're interested in, um, knowing how I modify these more. Um, I haven't done, I haven't gotten that crazy with them, but I have done these ones where it's a handkerchief hem and then cowl before. Um, it's not that difficult of a mod if you would like to know about that one too, but for this one, I'm just doing the basic one hour. So I'm added on my 10 inches down, four inches wide, little sleeve area to the top of my pattern here. And I'm gonna go ahead and add on the little ease section down here for the hips. All right, so this is hard to uh, show because it's such a big pattern. Those are my little sleeve extensions I just added up there. One, two, three, four inches across. These dots um, or numbers and letters and stuff like that are not exact measurements, so I don't use them to measure. I always use my ruler, but in general, you can kind of see that's four inches. Um, and then for the hip area, I came down, What remember I had decided it was going to be 22 inches from my shoulder to my drop waist. So from my shoulder line to my drop waist, I measured 22 inches down, and then I actually measured six inches out. Um, I just decided I wanted more ease throughout the hip, mostly because I wanted three inches on each side of my um, pleat that I'm gonna be doing in here. Table, stop squeaking. At the side seam at the uh, drop waist, I'm gonna be doing a little box pleat here. So this ease that I've added on the six inches will become three inches on one side and three inches on the other of this pleat. Um, the dotted line represents that this is gonna be inside. I will sew a line of stitching on the outside, but the pleat, of course, will be inside the garment like this. Uh, again, I'll show you that when we get to the sewing of it, but I just decided that six inches sounded like a good number for me. Um, you can add on less if you would like, um, just as long as it uh, encompasses your measurement. So again, um, this width here, uh, at this line, this pattern is already, you know, 40, what was it? What did I say it was? 42 plus 45 inches wide. I can I can do math. Um, so right here, because my bust measurement plus one and a half on each side, so my bust measurement plus three is 45 inches, which is 45 is bigger than my hip measurement, which is 44. Uh, this will already encompass my hips, but of course I want to add a little bit more just so I have some flow in the skirt. So I've added on the six inches, basically. Again, I always am like, am I making any sense at all? Hopefully I am. Uh, we've been doing a little bit more math geometry today, so maybe I have no chance for me, but I just added on six inch extension for the hip on that side, six inch extension for the hip on that side. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut the pattern out so you can see what it looks like. Again, from down from here, I just, along my rectangle is my full length. So from here to the shoulder line, this is my hem line to the shoulder is the 45 inches I decided on how long I wanted the dress to be too. So that's all, you know, using very simple measurements to create this huge, large, wide, eye-shaped pattern. I'm gonna go ahead and cut it out now so you can see how this big guy corresponds to this one that I drew for you to explain. It isn't the easiest uh, pattern to video here on the table, being so large as it is. Again, you can create this pattern in a half form. Just go ahead and have all the measurements and everything we've been talking about as we go, especially if you don't have wide paper or anything like that. Um, it might be easier to create just the half uh, version of this pattern, I suppose. But something I do want to talk about now, now that I have it cut out and we are looking at it, and you may have noticed that I've already added some, is seam allowance. So because you are doing, you are adding so much ease, for example, this is more ease in the hips than I needed. I mean, I didn't even need to add these panels because my measurement was going to be wide enough to encompass my hips anyway. So I didn't technically need to eat out, add all this ease. So if I were to, instead of adding seam allowance here, just eat up part of this, eat out of this pattern, um, it would be fine. I wouldn't lose the fit that way. Um, but because up here in the center portion of my pattern here, where it is my, again, 22 and a half because of my half measurement, half my bust measurement plus the one and a half inch of ease, I want to keep that one and a half inch of ease that I put in there. So in order to keep that three inches through the center of this pattern, I don't want to eat away any of that with seam allowance. So I'm going to add seam allowance so that I will add a half inch on each side of the pattern, 
on our side seam. Um, I don't know why I quoted that because it is our side seam. That's what it is. Um, so I'm adding half inch seam allowance along the center of this pattern, along the waist zone of this pattern so that I can retain that three inches of ease that I put in there because I do want this to be sort of a looser, more of a, you know, languid 20s look here. So I'm going to keep that three inches of ease I put in here by adding seam allowance along here. I'm not going to add seam allowance along these added sections because uh, I don't even need this ease. So it's not bad if I lose half inch of it. Same up here on these sleeves. These are four inches long. Um, you can make your sleeves longer or shorter, of course, whichever you would like, but I'm just going to end up with three and a half inch sleeves because I will just, I don't need to add any more length onto this. That's fine. I'm not too picky about it. Um, but then again, along the top edge of my pattern, if you imagine this is the center front of a very high neckline, um, we're looking at this drawing here again. This is just, this is where your, you know, your neck and your head will go. Um, this is a very high neckline. Uh, the way that you handle this shoulder seam or the seam like along the neck and, and shoulder, basically. Um, you can do this in many different ways. The way I normally do it is I uh, come up, you know, from the side seam up here. So I'm at this line, basically, with <laughs> my pattern minus the sleeve. Basically, this is the zone where my shoulder would be. Um, you can go ahead and stitch this. Um, I leave the neckline like the opening here at the neck large enough to pull over my head, of course. So you can come in as close to your head as you would like, but you want to leave enough room to pull this on over your head. Um, you can also, let's say if you wanted to uh, just sew a little bit of this down here at the very edge, um, just sew a little bit of it so that the rest of this hangs a little bit open, um, depending on how drapey your fabric is, it might cowl a little bit all on its own. Um, but what I often do up here, which is kind of a fun way to do this, is up here at the shoulder, I hem the front, I hem the back pieces. So it's all finished up here, but the shoulders are not sewn together. And what I do is I use beads and just sew the shoulder seams front and back together using um, beads to as like a fun look. You can also use ribbon. Um, you could do ribbon on each side and then tie a bow up here to hold the shoulders together. All the different options. I will show you what I mean by using beads when we get to that step, because I will be doing it for this velvet version here. And then I will show you doing it just like a normal shoulder seam along here for the other version of this dress I will do where I'm going to be using the side gathers as well. So I wanted to show you a couple of the different variations of the ways that I finish these. So that's why I'm going to be making two dresses today. But the velvet one, I will be hemming this top edge, hand hemming it actually, using seed beads and some glass beads for a little bit of a sparkle up here. Um, and of course, if you do not sew along this shoulder seam at the top of the sleeve and dress. Um, if you just, let's say, tack the front and back together here with some beads as I will do, this part here, if you don't sew it together, will hang a little bit differently. So you will see how that works out in this version of this dress as well. I'm again, having trouble explaining. Hopefully this is making some sense. Oh my goodness. Um, but in any case, your shoulder seam, you're going to need, and your neckline hem area, you're going to need a little bit of seam allowance. So I have added on a half inch of seam allowance to the very top edge of my pattern as well. Wow, that is what I really needed to tell you. And I told you all that other stuff as well. You know, that's what you're becoming used to here on this channel, isn't it? I'm over explaining for you, but hopefully that means that everyone has their question answered before they need to ask it. We'll see. Again, ask me your questions in the comments below as needed as usual. And now I'm going to take this out and lay it on a big section of floor so you can see the whole thing at once and we can get a good look at this pattern before I go ahead and cut it out of my velvet. Here she is, the full 1920s one hour dress pattern. Again, we'll cut one for the front, one for the back, sew them together along the sides, boop, hem the bottom, hem the top. Um, that's how we're going to be making this first one. And again, you can create this pattern in a half. I even have it folded here, so I'll show you what that looks like in halvesy form. So if you were to fold it along the center front, that's what your pattern would look like. You have your hip extensions, your sleeve extensions, full length of the pattern, etc., etc. Again, I do want to encourage you to make these a little bit longer than you think you need to. Uh, a lot of times our modern interpretation of 1920s fashion shows it as being super scandalously at the knee or even above the knee. A lot of times it was still below the knee on 1920s fashion. If you look at fashion plates, it's all about creating a long lean line. And part of the way they do that is having the dresses be longer. So a midi length is more, much more appropriate. So uh, that's why this one is 45 inches. I will actually be 
reconfirming in my head because that was a couple of days ago I decided that I want to reconfirm in my brain that that is how long I want it because I may add even more length because you can always cut a little bit off but you you know it's less pretty to have to sew anything back on so I am going to go ahead and lay out my velvet and cut this little guy out um I don't have any particular tips on cutting this pattern out uh each fabric has its own you know set of requirements I guess we should talk about fabric choices for this pattern or for 20s things in general so let's go back into the other room and we'll do that so let's talk a little bit about fabric selection for a project like this I haven't really talked about fabric selection for my projects that much as we go um just because I forget that it's something that not everyone knows to be honest uh it's I've been sewing for so long that I have a feel for what textiles to use for what but I forget that that's not something that is readily known or taught um even when I was in fashion school they did not tell us what fabrics to use for which desired end result it was an annoyance. It's a pet peeve of mine that they don't teach that enough. So I better not skip it here today myself. So for something like the 1920s one hour dress, you don't want to use a very stiff fabric. In fact, a lot of things in the 1920s are not done with a stiff fabric. This is a, I think this is like a twill. Maybe this is a plain weave. No, it's a twill. This is like a twill, cotton twill here that has a little bit of stretch in it. Also super cute fabric. I have a dress made out of this. And I realized I have enough here to make a pencil skirt, and I don't know why I haven't done that yet, so I'm going to be doing that soon. Um, but this is a slightly stretch, thicker twill. Twill weave, again, is like almost a denim. Um, it's a thicker, stiffer fabric. It has a very stiff drape to it. Um, so, like, if you were to make a 1920s dress out of this, it wouldn't have the movement and drape you would want to see in something like that. Um, this is better for, like, um, pencil skirts or structured jackets, uh, more better for mid-century things. Um, or if you were doing a 20s project out of twill, high-waisted sailor pants maybe, but not, or like a little jacket maybe, something that needs the stiffness and thickness. But you wouldn't want to make a 1920s dress out of this. I'm sure someone can make it work, but uh, as a general rule, this would not be a good fabric for the one hour in my opinion. Something more appropriate would be this. This is a silk fabric. This is a crisper silk still, actually, funny enough. Uh, this wouldn't be bad to work with at all. It's not like a chiffon, which I'll show you in a second. But you can see it has this flow to it. There's, it's a certain thin, it's kind of, uh, it's on the thinner side as well. Um, but it has this drape and fluidity to it that is going to help create that languid 1920s silhouette. Um, so this, although a um, tighter weave and therefore not so bad to sew with, I guess this would be... I mean, I'm not sure what this fabric is. It has a slight crepe feel to it, so I guess I would say it's like a silk crepe or a georgette or something. I just bought this at a discount fabric store where it was not labeled, and I don't know the difference between like a georgette, a charmeuse, all those kinds of things. I'm not fancy enough to know, sadly enough. I wish I had a better textiles class where they taught us that, but instead they showed us what silk looks like under a microscope, which doesn't really help me make clothes, unfortunately. But again, we're getting back to my pet peeve now, aren't we? Um, so this is a like flowy silk, and this would be a very good fabric for 1920s one hour. In fact, I bought this fabric to make a 1920s one hour, but now I've been thinking about making a blouse out of it instead. So it's still sitting here in my stash. This one might be good for a 1920s day dress. Um, this is just a rayon crepe, very lightweight from Joann's. Um, again, has the lightweight fluidity that we are looking for in a fabric for a 20s one hour. We don't want a stiff drape. We want a fluid drape. So this um, is a rayon crepe, which is fine. I think you could also use a rayon chalet. I don't know if I have one Ooh, nearby. This one is a rayon chalet. Um, but again, it has the fluidity uh, in the fabric, or like the flowiness is what we need here. Of course, a chiffon is also going to have that same kind of flowy drape we need. And because it's so thin, um, it does well and like gathers uh, while staying flat. Whereas if you were to like gather something like this it would become very puffy um where when you gather something like this it remains quite smooth still because the thinness and the drape of the fabric so that's good if you plan on doing any gathers um if you're doing the gathered version of this or any accents with gathering so a chiffon is good for that kind of thing and of course this just has a very 1920s look already i think you may agree um and then there are like fancy fabrics this one is a polyester net with sequins on it but this has uh, almost, I would say this is on the verge of being too stiff to make a 1920s one hour out of because the nylon or poly or whatever this, whatever polyester-ish kind of thermoplastic fiber this netting is made out of 
has a stiffness to it, whereas if it was made out of something like, say, a silk, it would drape a lot nicer. Um, because poly, there's something about thermoplastic filament fibers that still have a certain stiffness to them, which isn't always necessarily the case because this is a polyester chiffon here and it's much flowier, but like this is not a chiffon base, it's like a tulle base. And the weave of the base underneath these sequins makes a difference in how it drapes. So while this still has enough drape, I would be careful about doing a circle skirt in this. It's gonna have more of a body to it than perhaps you would like for 1920s things. But again, a tw one hour out of this would be very pretty in this nice sequin. In fact, this is a fabric I got at um, a local fabric store that they do not have anymore. And I wish they did because I wouldn't mind having a one hour out of this and having a basic black sequin one, but uh, they don't have any anymore. So I just have this one piece left um, I've used it to like insert into a sheer panel before, so I, I keep kind of scraps this big around in case I need to use them in the future. But that's just some basic, you know, options that are sitting around in my studio that would work for this. If you wanted to do more of a daytime dress, you could use a cotton. I just wouldn't use like a cotton twill, a cotton sateen. Anything on the thicker side is it going to be a no-go. Uh, Swiss dot, a light, lighter weight eyelet perhaps, a voile or a like a thinner fabric even like a seersucker as long as it was on the th as long as it was on the lighter weight side I think would work like a white seersucker 1920s one hour would be very summery and there's like a dress actually in Downton Abbey that's very similar to the one hour that I think I feel like she's somebody's cousin or something I don't remember this character much I'm sorry I haven't rewatched Downton in a while but she wears this white dress um to like a tea picnic-y situation and it's almost a 1920s one hour and just a very lightweight cotton so you can get away with making cotton day versions obviously but just don't use something thick like a twill or like a denim practically um it's just not going to have the right drape to it so that's an overview a little bit of fabric here um i'm going to be going ahead and using my polyester net and rayon velvet burnout which my fabric here that i'll be using today um again it is a poly net in here but it is much more of a chiffon style structure not a tool structure so it still has a lot more drape to it unlike that sequin one this one still has a kind of like flow of a chiffon even though it is again a poly fiber in here it's just arranged in a different way so this one works a little bit better this one is not a knit by the way this is a um woven fabric uh, a lot of times you can find burnouts velours and velvets that are knits i don't like working with knits i'm definitely showing you this pattern thinking that you're going to be using a woven fabric not a knit so I'm not sure how this pattern would behave or how this project would work in a knit. I'm sure it's possible and would be very extra comfortable, but uh, I use woven fabrics, so that's what I will be using today. So I've been trying to work out a way to kind of explain how to know how much fabric you're going to need for one of these. Because sometimes if you have a wide enough fabric, you can get away with having only like a yard and a half of fabric, depending on how big your pattern is. So. Uh, like I said, I've, I've promised this is a project where you don't need a ton of fabric. And it is true depending on the width of the fabric and the width of your pattern. So for me, here, these are all drawn to scale, by the way. So basically I've just drawn these rectangles to represent yardage. This is a 44 inches wide fabric and then 36 inches, you know, for a yard and another half yard. Um, so folded this fabric, if it were folded salvage to salvage like this, would be 22 inches uh, with a fold, you know? Um, and then over here, I've drawn a mock-up of 54 inch wide fabric, which sometimes you can find fabric up to 60 inches wide, depending on where you're buying fabric. At the normal, like kind of lower to mid range fabric stores, it's rare to find wider fabrics. Like at Joann's, I don't find 54 to 60 width as much as I do 44. 44 to 45 is pretty standard, or inches wide is pretty standard in the US. Um, at like craft stores and stuff like that, but for like designer fabric warehouses, um, places like Mood, places like discount designer fabric places, you can usually find wider fabric. And of course you're gonna need less of a wide fabric. So this is 54 all laid out with the 36 and then folded in half to get the um, 27. <laughs> I can do math again, can I? Um, so drawn to scale here, uh, each of these is this is an eighth of an inch to an inch, basically, is the scale we're going with here. So I have my little pattern. This is for 42 bust, 45 length. So with our six inch extensions, if we imagine that this is, what did I say, 22 and a half plus 12. 
So it's like a certain, you know, you could obviously you can make these thinner if you want to fit on less fabric, if you would like to, or you could add seams into this. If we were trying to cut this all as one piece and we needed to cut two of them front and back, how are we going to fit that on fabrics? So if I have a 45 width fabric and I want to make this 45 inches long, of course that doesn't leave us any room here. So that's, that's no good to cut it this way. Um, if we cut it parallel with the selvage, um, we can't fit two across, even if we were to like, you know, hypothetically, here, I'll borrow this one. Even if we were to fold this pattern and put it along the fold here and cut them like that, we'd still need three yards basically. Um, because this pattern fits, let's say we fit it well here. Of course we don't, we just have this excess down here. Um, this is coming into about a yard and a half would make me feel comfortable to cut one side of this. And then I would need another yard and a half to cut the back. Um, so I would need three yards of 44 inch width fabric to do my pattern here. Um, same, even if I did it on the fold, I would still need one and again. Now, if I come over here to the 54 inch wide fabric, I can technically cut it going this direction, uh, perpendicular to the selvage. Um, so I can cut it this way and then I can get away with doing one, two yards. Um, so if I have a 54 inch fabric, I only need two yards to make one of these dresses instead of three. So it really does depend on how wide your fabric is. Um, again, I could go this direction and I would still need three yards, but because this fits this way on a wider fabric, I only need one and then again, two yards. So I'm saving myself a yard of fabric by buying something with a wider width, if that makes any sense. Hopefully it does. Now, of course, my pattern is kind of on the larger side. If you are a smaller person with a smaller pattern, let's say yours, you only have a 36 inch bust. So that's, and maybe you don't need to make it as long because you are not wanting to make it as long or you are shorter or whatever. Um, so let's say you are a smaller person. You're down here at 36 bust. Now this one, especially if you make it shorter, if you make it a little shorter, you might just be able to fit it on here. And so that's, you know, you could get away with getting almost like a yard and three quarters if you wanted to be really particular and not have much extra. But again, you could definitely get away with only two yards, even on a 44 um, inch fabric. And then again, you could cut this on the fold again down here. Um, but it's better if you can, if you have a shorter dress, less than, you know, 45 inches, then you can cut it this way on even the short fabric. So depending on your size is how much fabric you're going to need. Um, definitely over here, you can have even less, of course. So imagine you have enough room to spare here. You would only need, you know, almost, you know, a yard and three quarters again. So depending on the size of your pattern and how wide of a fabric you're looking at will determine how much fabric you need for this project. So it just really depends on the size of your finished project. Just, you know, if you imagine the widest bit of your fabric and the, or widest bit of your pattern, you know, whatever your middle rectangle is, plus the extensions you add, and maybe you want to be able to get this, you want to be able to cut out two on only one yard of a wide fabric. You only have one yard of a very wide fabric. So you put that down and you notice, ugh, my extensions hang off the edge. Well, if you know, like me, for example, that your pattern here is wide enough already for your hips and you don't need all this extension, just make your extensions smaller. Um, just make them the whatever excess you have here. So this would come in like three inches and I would just have smaller amounts of fullness in the hips. Um, but because everything I already had enough fullness anyway, then this was just more decorative. I don't need to have that much decorative fullness of the hips. I can bring that in and fit it onto a yard and a half of a wide fabric. Um, of course, this is less of a problem if your pattern is less wide and you can get away. See like this one, the four inch sleeve extensions fit on here, no problem. So if you just shortened these six inches to four inches as well, again, you could get away with having less than a yard and a half of this wide fabric. So just thinking about uh, how much fabric you need for a pattern like this really comes down to how big your pattern turns out or how wide um, your pattern comes out wide and long and how the width of your fabric that you have available to you. Okay, so I have my dress all cut out here. It's still pinned to the paper, my two layers here. 
something I just wanted to mention, um, if you are using something like a velvet fabric like I am, this fabric, although a funny little burnout blend here, the velvet does still have a nap, which means it has a direction to it. Basically, like if you imagine the little fur like surface of a velvet, the hairs, for lack of a better term, point in a certain direction. The fibers all point in one way. So for me, they all point this way. It's best, uh, it, it lays smooth or like your hand flows across velvet smooth in one direction. You will feel it like the fibers resist your hand almost and it feels rougher trying to go a different way. So what I always try and do is make sure that the nap of the velvet, the direction of it, points down from like, this is the neckline up here. So pointing down from the neck, that way if I, you know, hold my hands next to my waist, things like that, everything always just points down and you wanna make sure the front and the back, of course, point the same direction. So um, depending on how you cut out your pieces, you know, if I were to cut them, cut them this way instead, then it would be across my body, the nap, which isn't technically ideal. Usually with a velvet, you do wanna cut it this way where the um, hairs, again, the fibers point downwards so it's smooth against the hand when smoothing over your dress um, and then of course up is has like a certain resistance to it it doesn't feel as nice so um, that's just nothing to keep in mind if you're using a fabric like this or using velvet ever is the nap the direction of that the way the fibers lay in you know a velvet like this you can really not see what I'm talking about but trust me you can feel it they all lay in a certain direction and so I wanted to make sure that the front lays with the nap going down and the back lays with the nap going down as well. Um, with a print like this where some ferns are pointing up, down, sideways, blah, 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 it's hard to know which way is up and down. Um, if you have a more directional print where like all the flowers are like this, then you will know on the back they need to point up, on the front they need to point up, and then you won't have to worry about this kind of thing. But with this kind of a print it would be easy to get turned around. So all my velvet faces downwards here and my neckline is up here. Um, these are my little sleeve extensions here at the top. So I just have my two pieces cut out here and for my first sewing step of this particular dress. Um, I'm going to be making this the way I usually make my more formal ones. Um, and then we will talk about a different ways to do this in the second dress. I'm going to be making a plain black rayon crepe, more of a day to night version of this as well, where I will do some different finishes. But for this one, this is how I do my more formal ones, how I finish them. So looking at our pattern here in a miniature version again, because talking about this thing when it's kind of massive is annoying. So here we are in a miniature version again. What I've done here, uh, this again is the neckline. This is the hem. These are our little side seams. What I'm going to do, and I know, you know, again, this is the lazy way to finish your interior seams. If you wish to do a fine couture kind of finish on these, if you wish to do French seams, whatever you want to do on yours, go ahead. For me, I'm going to go ahead and on both my front and back pieces, which again are identical and both look like this, I'm going to serge the under uh, side of the arm area or the sleeve area along the side seams and along the extensions I guess I probably won't serge along the bottom now that I look at it so excuse this but basically I'll leave where this pencil line is the neckline and the hem of the sleeves I won't serge those because I'm going to finish those in a different way but I will go ahead and use my black serging thread here and I will serge the underside of the sleeve the side seams and then the sides of the little hip extensions basically. All right so I have my edges that I was talking about surged now and I'm just starting to pin the dress together. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sew the areas I just surged basically. So I'm going to sew the side seams from the underside of the sleeve, the sides, skip this portion of the fold over here. I'm going to leave this open but sew the rest of the side seam down here. So I'm going to sew this along the sides of the skirt, along the sides of the middle, not this portion but yes this portion. Yes? Yes, this is the top shoulder neck area. Here's my little sleeve extension area. I have the bottom of the sleeve pinned down the side seam, skipping the skirt extension here, but along the skirt, yes. So I'm gonna sew along here, along the waist, and here, all is one. I will have to clip this little area here, of course, so that the corner will lie flat on the outside, but that's okay. And then I'll show you what I'm going to do with this fullness to control it and make it into a pleat here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and pin the other side here on camera and then sew along here, boop, and then along there as well. And then I shall come back to you.
Okay, so I just went ahead and sewed those seams here. I would like to note here as well, this is the underside of the sleeve. Um, I sewed in from there, backstitched of course, um, sewed in. I just left the needle down in the fabric, pivoted the dress and kept sewing this seam here. And I actually did stop about a little, I mean it looks about over half inch, but half inch before this line here. So I left a little bit of space here, a little bit of wiggle room that we will use. So I backstitched and stopped a little bit before the end of the um, the seam here. Give myself a good half inch there. Then of course this side extension area is left open, but then the side, the rest of the side seam along the skirt is sewn closed. Again, backstitching at the start, sewing along that seam to the hem, and then backstitching down here. Now this fabric says I can't uh, iron it. Actually the instructions from Joann's are to not iron this or not dry clean this, um, interestingly enough. It's hand wash fabric. Um, what I'm going to do is going to very lightly iron it with mostly steam and see if I can't press these seams open a little bit um, just because I don't know what this nonsense about not ironing is about. I guess this nylon, which is what this isn't actually poly, it's not it's nylon rayon blend. I guess this nylon perhaps can't handle being ironed, but we are about to find out the hard way. Um, in this little corner here also I do need to cut into this corner just as we snip our corners and our curves in life, um, especially with the kimono sleeves so that I can move. And that will just be open in here, which <gasps> is a dangerous time. You can, you know, correct this with some sort of, um, or reinforce this A, and then also put rayon seam binding in here, do more surging, do more surgery in here to strengthen this area if you sh should so desire. But as I am lazy, and it's not like I'm going to be wearing this more than once or twice a year, perhaps, because I don't do anything fancy, uh, I'm not too worried about it getting a lot of stress. So again, uh, you know me, don't you, after watching several of these videos. So I'm going to go ahead and clip this corner here, and then I will try and press what I can. All right, remember a minute ago when I said to leave a half inch of space here? I was <laughs> misremembering. I mean to say, go a half inch beyond. Aha, this is what I actually, you know, I was misremembering. I knew there was something to do with a half inch down here, but it's not that you leave a gap of a half inch, it's that you sew a half inch down into this corner here. So sew a half inch down here and we will use that when we are using this extension to make a little pleat here. Um, so this is the side seam here. This is the under side of the sleeve chilling up here. Um, so this is the side seam of the main body of the dress. This is where the hip extension is. So this little guy, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with him? You know, he's just chilling here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and if you imagine this is kind of ironed out here, and I'm going to pin it down like that, effectively creating a little box pleat all along the side seam area here. So I'm just going to, you can see that half inch sewn down here is useful because that's where I'm going to pin this just straight across. And then I will put a couple of pins here. And then from the right side, because we are obviously inside the garment right now, from the right side, I will sew a line of stitching to hold that down. Um, you can't, don't have to do machine stitching for this. You could do like uh, hand stitch this and make it quite invisible if you wanted to. You could, um, on the other side, I really, especially in this velvet, I don't think you're going to see my line of stitching very much. Um, depending on your fabric, if this is going to be a very obvious line of stitching, you could do it by hand so that it's more of a couture finish. You could cover it with applique, with a bow, whatever you want. Um, I don't mind the stitching showing because I don't think it will show that much. So I'm going to go ahead and put pins here to hold this pleat open here and then I will show you what that looks like from the outside 
or the correct side, the right side, and then I will just sew a line of stitching bloop, all along here on the outside of the garment to hold that pleat down, and that will be our side fullness contained. So let me pin this, um, I have the other camera going, pin this here. <laughs> So here we are on the right side out. This is our side seam. This is like the front and the back here. Of course, still right now they are both identical. Um, so these are what the pins look like. You can see them through the fabric here on the right side. And this is the sort of pleat we've concocted here at the side seam. So there will just be this little pleat here. I'm just gonna go ahead and do a line of stitching. Since I can sort of feel or see the um, other side through here, I will stitch from the top down and I will do a little bit of back stitching here, stitch along and a little bit back there. And I will just do that using the seam on the other side as my guide. So using the seam allowance, it's not like I'm just guessing is basically what I'm saying. I will be stitching along using the fabric pushing through from the other side as my guide to know where exactly to put that stitching. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and stitch that pleat down into place and then I can do the other side the same way. So you can see my pins are still in here, but this just has a line of stitching holding that pleat down on the inside now. So now we have this lovely box pleat here at the side seam that will allow some extra fullness over the hips and a little bit more drape and flow in my skirt. I will go ahead and just trim my threads here. I just backstitch to the front and start of that. Um, but you just want that to be perpendicular to your side seam, of course. Um, so you know, try and keep everything straight and even while you're pinning it. I will go ahead and come in here and take my pins out and cut my loose threads and then I will do the other side the exact same way. And here is what that pleat looks like on the inside, all sewn down now. Um, so we just have this lovely box pleat in here and I will go ahead and again do the other side exactly the same manner. Okay, so now that our pleats are done and the side fullness is contained in those pleats down here for the hip extensions basically, now I'm going to come up here and deal with the top of this dress basically. So we sewed along this seam, I clipped this corner so that this would lay nice on the outside like this. So this is our little kimono sleeve where it's cut inside like that so that it opens up and lays nicely. I did end up putting an extra line of stitching in there. I do believe I showed that um, just because after talking about it, even I didn't feel confident. So I put an extra bit of stitching reinforcement in this area. Hopefully I won't get a lot of stress. But up here in the top of the garment, we um, nice big T-shaped dress right now. I have these raw edges bloof, all along the neckline and the sleeves. What I'm going to do is I'm going to serge along all of that. I wasn't originally going to, but I've decided that turning this twice and like hemming it is going to be too annoying. So I'm going to go ahead and serge that all first and then I will show you exactly how I'm going to be finishing basically this whole edge. So here we are, the top neckline in the sleeve hem sort of area here are all surged now. You don't have to have a serger, you don't have to do it this way. Um, I just knew it was gonna be easier on this. Um, this is not the most fun fabric to work with. Um, it will fray 
um, easier, not like crazy bad, but uh, easier than most. Uh, and just anytime you're working with velvet, it's always a certain kind of certain kind of uh, temperament <laughs> as a, as it wishes to be, basically. <clears throat> um, but so you don't have to surge this. You can just turn it twice, a quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch to use up that half inch of seam allowance we added. And then I'm just going to go ahead and put pins all along the edge here and I will hand stitch this to be hemmed all along the neckline here, all along the sleeve hems. Um, and I will show you what I do to put a beads, put a beads, put beads on the outside of that. But basically if I'm going to be hand stitching it anyway, I might as well add a little bit of embellishment while I'm in here. But uh, you'll notice I don't, I haven't, technically the shoulder seam should be in here somewhere. This is the top of the sleeve here. Here's the shoulder and then here is the neckline. It's all of course a straight line on our garment here, but uh, I haven't sewn the front to the back at the shoulder. Um, that's because I will be doing that by hand at the very end here. So I am just going to go ahead and, and this little edge here will be left open at the edge of the sleeve, which I again will show you. Um, so I'm just going to go around this whole rectangle of the front neckline and say the back neckline, this whole rectangle area here, and I will just be folding it over that stitching and then using that stitching kind of as a way to help me fold over into a quarter inch double turned hem. So I've devised a little way to explain where we're at currently, where I'm at on the actual dress. Um, so if we imagine this little paper version is what we have. I have sewn along this underside of the sleeve, <laughs> down the side, and we have done the pleats down the sides on both sides here. So we have like kind of, you know, from the bust down of this dress done other than the hem. And up here, the shoulder seam is still open. So uh, although like here along the bottom edge, that is sewn. So this can open up, it's all open up here right now. So basically I have this rectangle of surged edge that I want to hem and make look nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn th this edge inside a quarter of an inch and then a quarter of an inch again and then sew it down, hemming it by hand with little beads on the outside so that it looks really nice and fun. So here I'm sitting at my desk. I just have some seed beads and some little black glass beads here and then a beading needle, which is bent because beading needles are really thin and so quite flexible and easily bent. Um, doubled, just regular uh, thread here, just uh, Coates and Clark poly cotton blend thread. Um, and then I have the, this is actually a neckline edge, but I will do the same to the edges. Um, I'll do the necklines first, front and back, and then I will do the long edges of the sleeves. Um, but I just have this turned, you know, once, down, and then again, <laughs> turned, and then pinned. This is going to be the outside, so that's the side I'll put the beads on. So I'm just going to be basically starting off down here at the corner, securing this hem down, but instead of just stitches on the outside, I will have little beads on the outside. So um, I will go ahead and start doing that. I have the other camera on, so hopefully you will be able to see what I'm doing on that. It is going to be black on black on black kind of things here. So we'll see if how visible it is, but hopefully through explaining it, you get what I mean. show you guys what exactly I'm doing. So basically you can kind of see here I've got stitches on the back side holding the hem down and then on the outside I am just using 
two seed beads uh, alternating with one of these little glass beads I have here. Um, so I'm just doing stitches in the back, like longer-ish stitches to be honest, on the back, and then putting beads on the front instead of just having little prick stitches along the front, or on the, along the outside I mean to say. Um, I'm going to have these beads, so just doing long stitches on the inside and beads on the outside to finish this top edge, and I will do the same along the sleeve hem as well. Here we have my lovely velvet one hour here, and this is our sleeve extension area, those four inches we added, and then of course the neckline, and this is all just hemmed with beads, so the inside has stitches and the outside has these little glass beads here. And then it's still open, there's no shoulder seam put in there yet. And then I went along the edge of the sleeve as well here. So what I'm going to do to sew the, sew the shoulder seam, as it were, is I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to leave a section from the shoulder to the edge of the sleeve open. So there'll be like a slit up here, basically. And I'm just going to use a bead to sew the two points here at the very end of the sleeve together. So we'll just have a little bead there in between. Well, I can't move with my left hand. So to sew a little bead in between those two points to hold that together. So there'll be an open section, kind of if you imagine this is the shoulder, this will be the sleeve here and it'll be open with like a slit there. And then I will use more beads and use those to sew a section of the shoulder closed. So coming up, if we imagine this is our, where we added that four inches on our pattern for the sleeve, coming up from there, starting here and then going in for maybe, I don't know, I, I guess I'll pin it and try it on and see how small I want to make the neckline here. Because of course I want to be able to pull this over my head, but at the same time I also, because there's no closure on this dress, you know, you just, it's big enough that you just pull it on. So I want to leave enough room for my head coming in from here to leave that neck opening large enough, but then I also want to make it small enough that this lays quite flat and nice still because this neckline of course is as high as possible. In fact, like there's no scoop out for your neck at all. So it's going to lay quite high. And in order for that to lay smooth, I do have to come in on the closer end. Um, you could of course add buttons here with some loops so that you could still pull it on and then loop a few buttons or beads closed to have that neck be tighter. Once you were able to pull it on over your head, if you wanted to add closure, things like that, I'm just going to go ahead and put a pin four inches, or like it's you know it's only three and a half now but uh in parallel to the underarm i guess is what i'm trying to say put a pin there probably come in three inches so that all closed with fun glittery beads here um i'm just going to be you know stitching with by hand just taking bits of each side stitching that together using beads in the center to create a kind of fun little sparkly shoulder seam doing that one little bead down here and that's how i'm going to sew the shoulder seams for this dress and then Later when I have the dress on, you will see better what that looks like, but really I'm not using any particular technique here. I'm just going to be using, you know, some hand stitches. Messy they may be up close, who knows? Um, and some glass beads here to finish off the very top edge of this dress. And then all that I will have left is the hem. So I have my sleeve and shoulder seam beaded nonsense all done. I'll just show you guys what that looks like. So this is just where the shoulder seam is. I just basically whip stitched, I think is what this is called. I've like stitched the two sides together like this and just added a bead onto my stitch as I went basically. Um, and it feels quite secure and of course leaves me with this sparkly little 
geode almost seam here where I have beads in the ditch of the seam. And then the rest of the neckline is open, but it's all hemmed with the beads, of course. Um, so that's pretty finished there. And then this little uh, keyhole on the sleeve I just left open and then did a single bead to connect those two points at the very end. So just a little bit of subtle black on black sparkle up here. I just think this is a really fun way to finish the formal versions of these. It reminds me a little bit of the way Fortuny used beads to close up seams. Of course, I'm no Fortuny, but um, you know, I can, this is as close as I'll ever get, so might as well go for some beads along my seams here. So that's what the shoulder seam looks like there. The dress is nearly finished now. Um, you could add, of course, more embellishment anywhere you wanted. You could add fringe, you could add tassels. This looks really fun with like beads or tassels here because this hangs down off the shoulder, you know, like, like that. So you can put a little bit of weight. Um, that's the other thing about doing beads like this is it lends a little bit of weight and stability to the sleeve. So this gravity pulls it down a little bit more with that glass along the edge like that. So um, it does help it drape a little bit nicer too, I think. Um, so all I have left to do on this 1920s one hour is the hem. And what I'm going to do for this guy, gosh, I just really can't decide. I pulled out some uh, rayon seam binding that I was thinking of sewing some of that along the edge and then turning the hem up and hemming along that rayon seam binding. I can't decide if I want to do, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and sew. Well, I really just don't need it because of this too, though. What do I want? What do I want? And then that binding will show through the sheer parts, but it would be a nicer finish. Blah. I think I'm just going to fold this up like an inch and steam it and hem it. Honestly, you could fold this again, you know, twice here. You could do the same finish along the bottom hem with the beads. You could turn this just by itself a little bit. You can hem things any way you want. But for me, weirdly enough, I think I'm just going to turn this up one inch. Oh, it would be so much nicer to use that, I guess, huh? But I just don't care. It's only me who will ever know. which corners to cut and where to save time and I don't care what my hem looks like inside. Sorry, not sorry. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just press my hem up here about an inch, a little over an inch really, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand stitch that down. I don't think I'll use beads on this one but um, I'm just gonna go ahead and stitch that down and then this dress will be finished but we do have another one to make today. So this gal, this lovely first one hour dress in the burnout velvet is finished now. I just have her hanging on our little rack here um, with a fun necklace that was sitting around. But we can see what the neckline finish looks like with that little beading up here on the seam and the sheer sleeves and all that good stuff. So of course I will be wearing this with a black slip, but of course a green slip would look nice too. I do need to make some new 1920s slips, so perhaps we can do that as a video in the future if you guys want to see something like that. Um, I, you can just wear your regular 40s or 50s slips underneath. Most of the time you can't really tell unless it's a really sheer fabric. But I try and make, when I make 1920s uh, style silk slips, I just make it so that the neckline of the slip is straight across. Um, just because it's a little bit more of a deco style as opposed to like the v-neck or like more shaped 1940s or 50s slips. But I think you can wear them just fine. It, it, you, as long as it's something more mostly opaque like this guy, you won't really be able to tell what style of slip you're showing, you're wearing underneath. I don't think it matters 
terribly too much unless you are quite dedicated to 20 style and you would want to wear 20 style all the time in which case you're going to need some 1920 style slips obviously um, but just for the occasional 1920s wearer such as myself i think you can just wear your any dress slip underneath this really um i just need a new black silk one because mine got thrown into the washer and dryer so my black silk slip ended up shrinking into a silk camisole and won't really do the trick anymore so i need to make a new black silk slip but until that, I will just wear this with my normal ones. So I'm very happy with how this one turned out. And now it's time to make another 1920s one hour in a more day to night kind of fabric. I have a black rayon crepe. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to cut that out. And uh, this is, I'm sorry, I don't have the face camera on <laughs> while I'm talking to you about this. I don't have any makeup on yet today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and cut out another one of these one hour dresses in the exact same pattern in black rayon crepe, just a plain black rayon crepe I found at Joann's. It's very lightweight, it's very flowy. Uh, and I'm just gonna make another one of these where I, instead of doing all this fun beading and stuff up here, just sew up the top of this shoulder seam as I would normally on any other garment. And then I will do gathering down here instead of this box pleat for that next one. So this one's got that pleat in the side and I will do gathering here instead, which comes with its own sets of fun time, so I will show you that and what that looks like in the end. Um, so I'm gonna go cut that one out, probably serge it if it can take it. Again, um, I forgot to mention when I did this, because I serged all the edges on this nicer fabric, I did serge a uh, swatch of that first, like a little test piece to make sure it could handle being put through the serger because I didn't want these two uh, needles to randomly pull on these threads or whatever. So I did test the fabric to make sure it could handle being serged which is what I will do with the rayon fabric I'm about to use again as well. So if it can't, if it does strange things to it, if it pulls at it, if it wrinkles it, if it does odd things here, the serger, I will go ahead and use rayon seam binding on it instead, but hopefully it'll behave through this again. You know, did they use sergers in the 1920s? No, but I'm not a reenactor. I am a vintage fashion lover. So I'm happy to get the look in an easier modern way if possible. So. All right, so here I am with my black version of this dress. I have sewn it up to the point uh, that I had with the last one where I sewed under the arm, along the side seam, left this top of the hip extension open again, and then sewed the side seams down here as well. And then of course everything is surged like I did the last one as well, um, including up here along the arm is surged and along the top neckline here. Now the difference is instead of leaving this area open and hemming it with beads and doing some fancy things, I'm just gonna go ahead and sew uh, to a neckline here. So this is like such a boat neck, it's a very high boat neck. Um, there's no shaping of the neckline at all. I'm leaving it straight. You can get away with this. I think it looks really nice with long necklaces with 20s things, as we can see with this one here. I think it just is really nice having that straight line across the neck with a long necklace. I think it's quite elegant. You can, of course, again, if you wanted to have a neckline here on your pattern and then finish that with a, face, with a facing or lining, you course could but for me I'm going to be leaving it straight again for this one but I will be closing the top of the sleeve and shoulder seam unlike leaving it open as I did in the velvet one so I'm just going to come in eight and a half inches from the outside here of course that's the four inch sleeve extension and then another 
four and a half inches basically for my shoulder seam, leaving me some room here again to pull this over my head like I, you know, like I need to do with this uh, style of dress. Um, so I'm just gonna come in eight and a half inches from the edge there, and I'm just gonna sew all across here. Then this neck edge I will, because this will be sewn and this will become seam allowance, it'll be turned under and I will just go ahead and either turn this twice, probably, turn this twice and just prick, stitch, sort of hem, blind hem this down for the neckline opening. And that will be that for the top of this dress. And then I will do the hem of the sleeves the same way, just turning twice, ironing that down, hand stitching it down. So I'll do that. And that's how I will finish the top of this dress here. Uh, this is the more simple, straightforward way of doing the one hour, of course, is to not get fancy up here like I did in the last one and just go ahead and sew that top of that sleeve and shoulder shut. So I just sewed those shoulder seams here and then left the middle open for my neckline, of course, and just uh, pressing the seam open and then pressing that seam allowance down that half inch all the way along as well. You can hem it as this or you can go ahead and tuck that underneath and then do it as a little tiny hem, which is what I will be doing when I finish this. I'm however, just going to leave this pressed for now and move on to doing the side hip fullness situation for this. Uh, version of this dress and then I will go ahead and do that hemming by hand here along the sleeves and then probably hem the dress as well the bottom of the dress all at once and do all my hand sewing sitting down at once find a nice podcast to listen to while I do that or something like that but before that we have to control the hip fullness on this one and we are going to be doing it in quite a different way than the nice simple and very straightforward box pleat that we did on the first one so for controlling the hip fullness added onto this particular one hour dress, I'm going to finally be doing one with the gathering in the sides. Um, you see this on a lot of the patterns. This is how the actual one hour dress, I believe, is supposed to be done. I usually do the box pleat because it's nice and sleek, but most of the time you'll see this shown in the 20s images. I'll try and put some here as being gathered in. Um, you'll see a slit is cut into the dress body and then this is all gathered into that area. This is a bit hard to understand, I think, especially from just like looking at old images. So I am actually going to show you on a piece of muslin first before I do it on this dress, just because it might get lost, the details might get lost in this black crepe. And I really want you to see what is going on. So I'm gonna go over to the table and show you with muslin. Here I have a sort of faux muslin side of the dress. As we can see, here's our little hip extension just as before. This, if you imagine, the rest of this would be the dress over here. Um, this is the rest of the sleeve. This is our side seam. This is our little faux hip extension area that needs to be gathered into the dress. Um, last time we did this as a pleat. You will, you will remember in our velvet version, we used this to create that box pleat. In this one, we are going to gather it. In order to do so, first we have to cut in along par or um, along that line, not even parallel, just on continuing this cut line, we're going to cut in three inches into the dress. I know this seems like a wild idea and I agree with you, but that's what we are going to do. You have to have, if you were just to gather this, there's nowhere for it to go in the dress because the dress ends here and you would have this big fat section of gathering that would have nowhere to be sewn in. So you need space to sew that gathered in, um, gathering in. So 
what I'm going to do is go ahead and I'm going to slice with my scissors down to this point. Then I'm going to put two lines of gathering stitching in this little extension part here. So I will go ahead and cut that and then show you what I mean. <laughs> I suppose if you were being very, very proper about this, which as we know, I cut corners, so I am not, uh, you would perhaps do some sort of stay stitching around this or basting around this area, um, single layer, uh, to make sure that nothing crazy happens. But as long as you're doing this, I'm not flinging it about, it should be fine, I think. So what I've done is I've just cut in, again, imagine the rest of the dress is here. This is just a muslin version. This little cut here I'm going to have to do right here on my actual dress. I'm gonna have to cut in three inches here and on the other side as well, three inches here. It will be nerve wracking to cut into my project, which is why even I am practicing on the muslin first. So here we are. Um, you're going to put gathering stitches along here, not through these two layers. Hold on, let me um, open up this dress. This is the side seam. Try to remember where we are, I guess. Um, if we're looking at this little guy, we're over here. I'm gonna open it up so we're looking at it like from this direction. So we're looking at the side seam and the skirt side seam as well. And you can get a different kind of bird's eye view of this whole situation opened up. Imagine this is the front of the dress, this is the back of the dress, and this is one of our side seams. So last time we put this and we made it into a box pleat opened up here. Obviously I didn't have to slice for that. This slice was not needed and we could just go ahead and box pleat this fullness down and we sewed a line across this pleat top from the outside. But for this one, we're gonna take all of this fullness here that would be put into the pleat if we were doing it that way. We're gonna put two lines of stitching along the top of this to gather it in and then we will sew it together by pinching this gathered area and the rest of the dress together here and sewing from tapered to nothing encompassing this gathering and then tapering to nothing again. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my two lines of gathering stitching in all along the length of the extension and that three inch cut. So from here to here along this floppy guy, I'm gonna go ahead and put in two lines of gathering stitching using my largest stitch length on my machine. And then I will come back to you and show you what comes next. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull on these two threads to gather this down to fit into this slashed area. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my camera, my camera phone down and uh, gather all this using these two threads, pulling on those to gather this down into a space that will fit into this slash we have cut. Okay, so I've pulled these threads in order to gather all this area up until it is smooth uh, and the gathers fit this, or basically until this length here is the same as the length of our slash here. So it's all gathered in here. And then you just do want to space the gathers out so it's not like all gathered on one side or the other. Just try and scooch them around with your fingers until there's like an even, the gathering is even evenly spaced out. Oh, I can't speak anymore. Again, imagine this is like the front and the back of the dress. This is along your side seam. Keep keep track of where we are. So now in order to sew these gathers here, um, you know, hypothetically, if you were doing a gathering, a gathered skirt on one of these, this is to do it without having to cut a separate piece. So usually were I to do a gathered skirt, <laughs> I would want seam allowance to be there because basically you're putting in a seam here where there was no allowance made for it because you cut this out as one piece. Um, if I were to do a gathered skirt on one of these, and I weren't trying to do like a one hour dress, I was doing something more, you know, planned and proper. I would go ahead and cut along here and add seam allowance to this top, you know, bodice quote unquote pattern and skirt pattern so that I could have seam allowance along this seam and there would be a seam across the center of the dress, but I could also put gathers in the center then, all along it if I wanted to, in little collections, whatever I wanted to do. Um, but this, however, with the one hour dress pattern, it's just along the sides where the gathering is and there is no seam allowance other than the kind you kind of 
pinch out. So like this, you're losing an inch here, a half inch from the top and a half inch from the bottom. And like your hem will come up a half inch even. Um, no, no, no pattern I've ever seen for this uh, compensates for that lost space down at the hem. It, I guess you could like re-even out your hem, which in this crepe fabric I'm using, I'm going to have to anyway because it's a pain in the ass to cut it straight, let me tell you. Um, but I've never seen a pattern allocate an extra space down here along the hem to account for that shrinkage. Um, but I think it's because a lot of the 1920s dresses, they do have a hem that curves. Like down here, it kind of curves a little bit. And so because this will create a slight effect like that, it wasn't considered a bad thing. So I, I don't think... If I were working with a fabric that would hold its grain and it was nice, I wouldn't bother to reach through the hem, I don't think. But I'm going to have to have put this on and have someone help me pin the hem because it's all wonky already anyway because working with a very slippery rayon crepe always so fun working with flowy fabrics but you can see why you need a flowy fabric if you're going to be gathering all this into such a small area you don't want it to be poofy like this you don't want it to like poof out at the hips because I mean it is a certain style of 20s dress called the robe de style but one here does have poofy hips so you can get away with it um but you just want to make sure you're making a conscious decision if you want something like this as opposed to something over more of a sleek line you just want to know what you're getting yourself into so um all that to explain here I have this gathered I'm now going to go ahead and take these and this is the inside of the garment as we can see because we have seam allowance here and pinch these together and pin along here to create a seam here which is of course corresponding to right here where we slashed it so I'm going to go ahead and pin this and then I'll talk to you about it This is that slashed edge to our gathers here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sew this with a half inch seam allowance here, but I'm going to fade it out like almost like you would to a dark point out here at the end. So I need a, like at least probably a quarter inch here, starting wanting to have a half inch seam allowance in life, <laughs> but tapering it down to nothing at the sides basically is how I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna sew kind of a half moon here with this machine and taper it into nothing that captures that gathering in. So I'm gonna go ahead and sew that and then I will show you what it looks like because it's kind of hard to explain. Perhaps it's easier when you have that dark line of thread to show what I mean. All right, and here we are back inside. I did get a little bit messed up because I forgot to change my stitch length back to something small. So I still had on the large stitch length. Um, I do think actually I tried to start from a taper and come in and then taper back out. I do think actually it would be easier if you started here at the center and started at a um, half inch like this and then tapered out to one side and then tied off like I normally do my darts. I just tie off the threads like that after I come off the edge. I went about an inch off of where the gathering ends, by the way, to taper that. Um, and then to come back here in the center again, start sewing again back and forth and then come and do the other side the same way and come off the edge. I think it's just easier to taper when you're ending your sewing as opposed to starting on a taper. Um, so I think it's easier to start here in the middle and go off and then start here in the middle again and go off and then just tie those ends down as if you were doing a dart you know that's not that dissimilar from a dart if you look on this side it looks almost like a double-ended dart it's not that different we just have this gathering in here and I think if I were to do this which I'm about to on that black dress I would press this down um, even though that might poof out these gathers a little bit we'll see I have a pretty flowy fabric over there so this is what that would look like on the inside of the garment which I might end up encasing this uh, or surging along this edge or something so that that doesn't fray. And on the outside, if you were to turn, your, to turn your dress right side out, this is your side seam, again, like front and back of the dress, imagine. This is what your little hip fullness looks like on the outside. Now, it's creating a little bit of puckering here, but I think the weight of this, when you had it on, would hold it pretty straight. Again, this is ending almost like a dart. You're making, you're taking seam allowance out of a garment where it was not added in the pattern um, because you know you're cutting in here and there's no seam allowance for that seam to happen so that's why you're getting this puckering here which I why which is why I always do these as a pleat instead because I don't understand why they thought this was a good idea in the 20s but clearly they did a lot of times so, um, you'll see these dresses have some gathering here inherent in the pattern too and I think that helps camouflage what's happening here um, if you plan in your pattern 
if you add in a couple of inches of ease here, if you make this longer in um, anticipation of gathering a little bit here and do a couple of gathers here or even a couple of pleats here to create a little bit of a shearing or gathered section across the waist here, it really will camouflage the situation. But that's why I think, you know, if you want to do gathers for the skirt on this, even if you only want to do them on the side like this, I would still just put a seam along the whole dress here and then you would have seam allowance, which doesn't, which means this doesn't happen. You don't have to taper into anything. You can just have a seam here and it will be fine. You could even, if you wanted to, you know, do a pin tuck along that whole way. But I just don't see any reason why not to just cut this into two pieces and do the gathered skirt that way. Um, this is something that really mystified me when I first started doing these 1920s dresses. And I still don't really get why it was done this way other than that you don't have to have a seam across the center front but like and the center back but like i'd rather just have a seam here who's gonna be like oh my god look at that seam across your dress like no one cares i'd rather have a seam than have these little weird puckers but we're gonna add them onto this dress that i'm making right now and we'll see how the finished thing looks so maybe it pulls straighter and looks nice when it's being worn and uh there's that so i'm sure many of you on the internet will be able to tell me a solution to make this look better, but I'm just trying to do it the way, as I understand the 1920s patterns said to do it. Um, this seems to be the way that they suggest, is just to do this. Um, and I guess because sometimes they have the gathering here, that's really what is camouflaging the sins of not having seam allowance here. It's not my favorite method, but it is one of the methods suggested in a period accurate nonsense. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this to my black dress over there. Look at this mess. Honestly, I need to clean this room so badly, you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and do this, the slashing into my project and the gathering and all that jazz on my black version. I might not film that much of it because I've gone into detail on the muslin. You can see it much better on this. And it's honestly going to be stressful for me to do it on the on the actual project. So we'll see how much I get that recorded. I'm sorry for not doing it super detailed over there, but I think I tried to cover it as much as possible in a way that people can see and understand. <laughs> camera is so mad so so angry with the lighting in here that's what i'm telling you trying to film things on black fabric it's too bad that i like making things in black all right so i've gone ahead and done that same thing i just did with the muslin to my two hip extensions on this dress and i do think it lays a lot smoother um you know tapering out to nothing again um like i did the muslin it lays a lot smoother in the rayon so that's a nice thing to know it puckers a lot less so if you have a less stiff fabric that is going to look better which is good to know this is what it looks like on the inside. I did go ahead and take this seam afterwards and go ahead and run through the serger again so I don't have any raw edges along that little friend there from having cut into the fabric there. So everything's encased and surged here along this seam. And I have my gathers in here. So I'll go ahead and turn this right side out so you can see what it looks like from the outside. And hopefully the camera will stop freaking out. So this is what it looks like from the outside. Of course, one side here and the other side here. We do still have our little bit of puckering from not having seam allowance. Um, funny how, because on a dart, I guess you have bust to full, fill this area. If you have a dart going like this and tapering off to nothing, it's fine, but for, in from the side, 
less so. I don't know. Um, but the gathering looks like this on the outside. I think it looks quite nice. Of course, this is a long, this is the um, sleeve extension up here. So this is along in the side seam area on each side. And now I'm going to go ahead and do that little hemming I talked about up here at the neckline, folding that in and, and again, quarter inch around the slit, the like slit that's in here for the neckline and then along the edge of the sleeves as well. So I'm going to go ahead and go actually have dinner and then come back down and do all that hand hemming up here. And then I will go ahead and also hem the dress itself as well. Now I do apologize for the loud air conditioner in the background, but again, there's just nothing I can do about it at this current time. I, my apologies. So here is the finished burnout velvet version of this dress. The first one I made with that box pleat to control the hip fullness on the sides and then the beading up by the neckline and along the uh, shoulder seam and along the hem of the sleeves here. Again, you know, just a very simple column kind of dress. Um, I have enough ease in this that it moves around when I shake a little bit. Not that you'll find me shaking very often seeing as I sadly do not dance and cannot Charleston, but here is the finished velvet version. I'm really happy with it. I'm sure I will get a lot of wear out of it. I do like wearing this uh, style of evening dress or cocktail dress really out because you it is so comfortable. Uh, you can really have a quite glamorous look, but still be very comfy and eat as large a meal as you want. Go for dessert. Um, I find these very useful for things like going to the symphony, the opera, the ballet, the theater. Not that I get to go very often anymore, but back when I used to go more often, I would wear things like this just because it's very comfortable to sit in and be in an all, um, all night when you're going to like a longer event or things like that. Things where you're sitting the whole night. If you're going to be standing, you know, you can get away with corsetry and more uncomfortable quote unquote things. Um, but if you're going to be out for like a four hour long event, you kind of want to be comfortable and 1920s is there for you so you can still feel glam but also feel comfy. And then of course here is the second version I made in a black rayon crepe. This crepe is from Joann's and I'm actually quite happy with it although it's a pain in the bum, a real pain to cut this fabric to like lay your pattern out. You really have to fiddle with it to make sure it's not moving around on you too much. Like if you breathe on it wrong it will go off grain and scoosh around. Um, but it wasn't so bad to sew. It is actually a little bit thicker than I thought it was going to be in practice basically and it was nicer to sew than I thought it would be. Uh, I really thought that the gathers over the hips on this were going to give me a lot of trouble and in fact I really like how it came out. I'm happy. I've only ever done this version of the sides in muslin as like a mock-up and I didn't really like the way it looked in muslin so I've never actually used it on a dress but I'm quite happy with how this dress came out and I'm so pleased to finally have a plain black 1920s dress. I made one out of a polyester crepe once but I just didn't wear it as much as I had planned on because poly is just not as comfortable, not breathable, doesn't drape as nicely, all the things. And so this one, I'm sure now I'm going to get so much wear out of having a finally plain black dress. Also for evening, you can dress this up a little bit more for evening wear because it's just a plain woven fabric, but it's not too daytime. It's not too evening looking. So I think this dress could be worn for day or for evening. Here I've paired it for day with a wool hat and some gloves um, and my 1920s uh, slash Edwardian shoes from American Duchess. These are a uh, gorgeous shoes. I don't remember the exact name. I think they might be the Theta. I can't remember what they called them. I'll put the name of them here. These shoes are available in black and in ivory leather from American Duchess and they are uh, gorgeous. They have this sort of skeleton effect on the front. Love them. You can put any color ribbon you want in here. I've left them actually with the ribbons that they came with, but these are a very accurate 1920s um, or like early 20s shoe. I think this works through the 30s. The shoe uh, styles didn't change that dramatically when it came to something practical like these. And then I do have these um, other beaded shoes. You'll see me wearing one of the clips here uh, from again, Mary American Duchess, but these ones are no longer available. So I do apologize for that, but they're, I had to snap them up when they were because they're gorgeous. Um, so that's where the shoes and these outfits came from is American Duchess or Royal Vintage. Um, one of my favorite shoe brands, sister brands, as everyone knows, I will link them in the description below because I just do love their reproduction footwear. They're the best as far as I'm concerned. And then I did end up making a little like shawly scarf sort of thing with the extra fabric for this one so it matches. So I can wear it just as a little matching scarf, tighten a bow, use it as a sash around the drop waist if I want to, change it up a little bit with this little matching sash if I should like. Um, when I have leftover fabric I do try and either save it for a project if it's a big enough piece or something like this where it was a long rectangle piece. I figured might as well just throw it into a little scarf to wear because it will match the dress. So yeah. 
So those are two options that I like for working around the 1920s one hour dress pattern. Of course, this did not take me one hour. These two dresses took me a week here um, to pull together for all of you, especially because I do a lot of little hand sewing things with these, but it would take a lot less time if I was working with like a lightweight cotton and doing a simple summer little version of this. If you'd like to see something like that in the future, do let me know in the comments below or let me know any other deco era kind of projects you're interested in seeing from me. Of course, I'm always open to hearing new ideas or what you guys want to see from me in the comments. Um, so leave me all that kind of stuff down there. And thank you as always for tuning in today. I hope this video was helpful for any of you trying to start into 1920s sewing or just wanting to an easy 20s project as we enter the 20s here. God help us. But as always, thank you for watching today and I'll see you again soon. Bye.